is still God's lane. Because Jesus said to Pilate, when he claimed authority over Jesus, there's church and state right there if you're listening. Amen. He said, you would have no authority over me unless it had been granted to you from above. Wow. So Caesar's lane is also God's lane. And when Caesar is upholding God's wills, will and ways, we should be there too. Amen. This separation of church and, church and God, state and God, I said that wrong. Separation of state and God is not right. Read the Declaration of Independence. Amen. Read the Declaration of Independence. That's why even conservatives today don't reference the in the Declaration of Independence because where we get our rights from is clear. It ain't from Washington. It's from God. And when Thomas wrote those, he said, among these, not all of them, but among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of not happiness. That's what it says. But George Washington says virtue. How do you have to pursue virtue with that God? I'm so tired. You know, those guys were Jesus. They weren't real Christians. Baloney. Are we, 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 are we we're real Christians? If we were, we'd already be home. Amen. You were talking about that to the Sabbath school, yeah. weren't you, right? Yes, sir. Oh, my. Oh, my. Jesus said you would have no authority over me unless it was granted to you from above. That's God's land, too. So I believe it's careful, I believe it's important, I'm going to try to move along here quickly, to be careful about moving outside the context of Matthew 22. No, Jesus is not a promoter of anarchy. I'm not talking about anarchy. Which is the non-recognition of the proper authority. Like we see in the streets of America, that is absolute disgrace. Absolute disgrace. Yeah. Call burning down a building in a protest. That is so unconstitutional. So anti. Orderly government is the invention of God. Orderly government is the invention of God. Order is heaven's first law. Wrote a little lady about 150 years ago. Order is heaven's first law. Unlike the leaders of the French Revolution, the founders of America, such as James Madison, said men are not angels, they need government. But I'm going to tell you something else. Government needs government too. <laughs> government needs governing. And that governing agent was laid out for this country in the Declaration of the Constitution. And they said it came from God. Moreover, the founders knew that government is run by men and women who are not angels, and they need to be monitored by appropriate representation, not dictatorialness, not, not a dictatorship, federalism, separation of powers, checks and balances. Yes, it's true, Jesus is our example in all things. But he's only the example to the believer, by the way. He's not an example to the unbeliever. Amen. Those principles which he lived and modeled were done so in a much more difficult environment than we're living right now. But we're going to move into his environment very soon. What do you mean by that? We still have a certain degree of liberty that Jesus did not have in his day. Amen. Be careful when his day as a citizen of Israel is compared to our liberty as American Americans. They're not the same. What do you mean by that, Dale? Jesus 
Jesus lived in an abject dictatorship. There was no constitution there. <laughs> there was no declaration that he could appeal to. We have one, and we're not like we should. Mm. Two different contexts. Even Jesus in a dictatorship, though, I love this, defied authority. At times. Remember he had been banned from the temple? He had been banned from going to church. And what did he do just a few days before his trial? He showed up in church. He cleansed the temple. He cleansed the temple at the beginning of his ministry. He cleansed the temple at the end of his ministry. In defiance of the authority. Why? Because Caesar was in God's lane. Are you listening to me? Caesar was in God's lane. And then, not too long after he ascended, what did good old Peter and John say to the authorities on multiple occasions? We must obey God rather than man. Stay out of God's lane. At this point, it might be helpful to review what I've seen as the four main models of church-state relations. Follow this carefully. There's one that's kind of a hard word for me to say since I'm an old southern boy. Erastianism. Erastianism. That's, in, that's a type of church-state religion relations where the state controls the church. As we saw in the Soviet Union, when the communists took over, they ran the Russian Orthodox Church, more or less. The Russian Orthodox Church didn't do nothing that Moscow said they couldn't do or couldn't do. The second type of church state relations is called a theocracy. We're a little more familiar with that one. That's where the church controls God, controls the state. A good kind would be a good example would be Israel, ancient Israel. A bad example would be Iran. I don't, that doesn't need any explanation, does it? That's a bad form of theocracy. The third type, and this is one that's really starting to worry me. Not worry me because I have the I have the Bible right here. I just read it in Revelation 13. It's going to happen. But it still bothers me when I see my own people. It's called Constantinism. Remember that guy? What did he do? 325 AD? Come on, church. He united them. He even united them. Church and state said, well, you know, we got to placate these Jews maybe a little bit, but Sunday's our day because we got to placate the pagans too. Constantinism. Constantinianism is the compromise where the state favors the church and the church accommodates the state in order to retain its favor. The church accommodates the state. That's the part that's starting to bother me, right? The church accommodates the state in order to retain its favor. That's Constantinism, and it's Revelation 13ism too. And the fourth one is a partnership, which our country was founded on, where church and state recognize and encourage each other's distinct God-given responsibilities in a spirit of constructive collaboration. And the extent of that collaboration for our country is beautifully laid out in the Declaration of Independence. Some have even called the Declaration of Independence, which is not denominational. Come on. Some have called that Declaration of Independence our civil religion. <clears throat> okay, let's see if we can say a couple of things about Romans 13. I could always do another sermon on this. Bottom line of Revelation of Romans 13, you can turn back there. <clears throat> Oh, 
I'll endorse this partnership, not this dictatorial, dictatorial ship of whatever Caesar says, it goes. Paul is not issuing a blind obedience to the nasty Caesar of the day as often some people interpret it. No, no, no. That Caesar of the day was, Paul would be a hypocrite if he was endorsing, you obey Caesar willy-nilly. Have you studied what Nero was really like in the days of Paul? He killed his mother, he killed his daddy, he killed his brother, he killed, he kicked one wife to death. He castrates a boy that kind of looks like a woman that he looked, that he kicked to death and marries him. Paul is saying, bow down. No. Are you with me? Paul says you have a brain. What is God like? Paul is not issuing blind obedience. Paul says, pay your taxes. Obey the law as far as you can. Paul detects, what he's doing here, I believe, is he depicts rulers in a positive light, not Caesar. A true leader, ruler will do this, Paul says. A real leader will do that. Paul must be stating the divine ideal, the ideal of heaven, not the reality of his day. Are you connecting dots? I hope so. So it was with our founding document it's, as it relates to separation of church and state. <clears throat> Life, liberty, and the pursuit of virtue. The real essence of happiness is the pursuit of virtue I've discovered. Have you finally discovered that in your life? Yeah. The pursuit of virtue is the pursuit of happiness. Just one more comment on Romans 13. Did you know that Romans 13, the passage I just read, is really what started the founding of this country in a lot of ways? It is. There's a man in Hillsdale College by the name of Thomas Wells. West, who's done a brilliant, he's written a brilliant paper called, what's this? The Transformation of Protestant Theology as a Condition of the American Family. Isn't that cool? You see, when America, America was, oh, come on, New York Times, you're making a joke saying that our country was founded in 1619. Our country was not founded until 1776. They're only off by 160 years or so. What else are they off on? Most of everything. <laughs> in, in 1750, there was a little 30-year-old preacher up in Boston by the name of Jonathan Mayhew who wrote, who, who preached a sermon on Romans 13. He awakened me. I read his sermon. He flipped on his head the traditional understanding of submitting to the government. In fact, the title of his sermon is A Discourse Concerning Unlimited Submission and Non-Resistance to the Higher Power. I'm going to say that again. A discourse Concerning Unlimited Submission and Non-Resistance to the Higher Power. Oh, King George, we got to submit to him. Read the Declaration of Independence. We're not going to submit to him anymore. Our second president, he's one of my favorites. Even though he and Thomas Jefferson butted heads all the time. They're sometimes called the best of enemies. John Adams said that every single person in Massachusetts either heard or read that sermon. And it was a major catalyst for Hey, maybe God wants us to be a nation. He's King George certainly, certainly isn't getting, getting it done. He's nothing but a pressure. And in the Declaration of Independence, by the way, 26 years later, did you know the original draft of the Declaration of Independence Thomas Jefferson put in there that we got to stop this slave trade now? Did you know that? You won't read that in the New York Times. I'll show you the quote if any of you want to see it. It's amazing. 
It's absolutely amazing how we've been, had the wool pulled over our eyes. And it irks me. Just 15 years after that sermon was preached, John Adams wrote what I call the second most brilliant treatise on the separation of church and state that I've read, ever read in my life. It's called a discourse. I'm mean, sorry, a dissertation on canon and feudal law. That is a discourse on separation of church and state. It is brilliant. You can read it online. It's only 12 pages. It's called a dissertation on canon and feudal law. It's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely. Little wonder that Ellen White it hurt her. What did she say about the Declaration of Independence? What did she call it? The grand old doctrine. And that word grand, according to my dictionary, says foremost. Foremost. In fact, she says in the next sentence, she says, it was the Founders' Bill of Rights. Wait a minute, I thought the Bill of Rights were in the Constitution. They are. First ten, but Madison and a few others didn't want it in there. Do you know why? Because his, we have a lot more rights than those ten. Those ten are inherent in the Declaration of Independence. If you understand the Declaration of Independence, amazing, amazing. I'm going to stop right there. Well, in thirteen, I have two or three more pages, but I want to just say a couple words about chapter thirteen. Revelation 13. Just a couple as I want to stay. This idea of resisting government when it's wrong is a very dicey one I fully acknowledge. When Abraham Lincoln opposed the Dred Scott decision declaring the slaves property, human property. He knew exactly what he was doing. He was almost prophesying his own assassination just less than 10 years later. He knew what he was doing. But he was more concerned about doing the right thing than protecting himself. Doing yeah. the right thing. It reminds me a little bit of back when I was a boy there in South Africa, many of you remember, it was terrible. It still goes on to a certain extent. In fact, it's kind of flipped the other way, so like the apartheid laws of South Africa, which were more, in some ways, more onerous than the Jim Crow separation here in America. But in 1957, the South African government attempted to impose a regulation on the church. On the church. Which would have prevented any racial association in church, school, hospital, club, or any other institution or place of entertainment. Much more to come than Jim Crow. It was a little more draconian than social distancing. The Anglican, Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town refused to bow down. Instead, he stepped up. He decided that along with these bishops that they would defy the government. And they did. Praise God, they did. In chapter 13, this is where it gets really serious because we're down here now. We find that the second beast of Revelation 13 has those two lamb-like horns symbolizing the separation of church and state. And on the same head. On the same head. It's a partnership model. Separate, but it's a partnership. It's kind of like a, sort of like a husband and wife is supposed to be. And sadly, in Revelation 13, we're told that an America will make an image to the beast.
What is an image to the beast? What is an image? You talked about his Sabbath school, right? When you look in the mirror, what do you see? You see it yourself. In America, we speak like a dragon. And we've traditionally believed, and we all believe we're correct, that that will most clearly be exposed when they try to impose worship on, on Sunday, first day of the week. State and church will collude. And if you think about it carefully, in one interesting way, they already have. And it's not with the evangelicals, it's with, within the government. Because the government itself is its own religion now in America. That may be the most dastardly, most cynical move of the devil to create church and state ever. The state has become the church as far well. So it's just a easy step across the abyss to the little Vatican where the church and state are already one. Does that make any sense? Makes some sense to me. I hope it makes some to you. While it's true, we don't want to be guilty unnecessarily bringing a time of trouble early on ourselves. If we don't push back when liberty of conscience is being chipped away now, Will we have the moral courage to push back then? I don't think so. As I've already said, quoting Jeremiah 12, 5, if you run to the foot and the neck, how are you going to run with the horses? What are you going to do when the Jordan swells? Ask yourself that question. Am I just listening? And say, okay, that's what they said on the news. That's what Dr. Fauci said. So I'm going to do it. Or are you thinking clearly? Don't trust me. Trust God. Amen. For above the distractions of the earth, he sits in the front. All things are open to his divine story. And from his great and calm eternity, he orders that which his providence sees best. And don't trust the God. Trust God. Thank you, Father. Oh, Father, it's painful for me as a 10th generation American. me to see what's happened to this great country. You set it up. You set it up. You gave us the finest founding principles and they've been flipped on their heads, Lord.